Good morning and welcome back to our studies on what happened to one when believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, the fifth session of our study. In the previous lessons, we learned what happened to one one believes in the Lord Jesus Christ in relation to God the Father and God the Son. And this morning, I would like to bring it into your notice certain aspects which takes place when a sinner believes in the Lord Jesus Christ in relation to the Holy Spirit of God. So this will be, I think, a most beneficial class for those who listen because there is much confusion among the Christians in regards to various things that take place in the life of a sinner when he trusts the Lord Jesus Christ as his own personal Savior and Lord. So this morning, I would be sharing with you some factors pertaining to this subject, that is especially in relation to the Holy Spirit of God, what may happen when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing I want to point out on this connection is based on John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 3 and 7, where our Lord Jesus Christ had spoken to Nicodemus, the man who came to see the Lord by night, that he approached him eagerly or earnestly to know about how to obtain eternal life in one's personal life that Jesus said to him, that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So in answer to his question, the Lord Jesus said that except a man be born again by the word and by the spirit that he shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Nicodemus prima facia, he could not understand what the Lord was talking to him, but Jesus explained it by the example of a wind which bloweth. He said that from whence it comes and where to it goes that nobody knows. But uh, uh, the people who experience the wind can understand that it comes, comes from some places and it goes to some other destination. One who is born again by the Spirit of God is also in the same manner. That means we cannot explain the process of new birth, but we can experience it in our personal life. If somebody asking me that how I understand, how did I understand the concept of the rebirth or getting born again, that I would explain him that I don't know how this happened. I cannot explain it. But something happened with my life the moment I accepted Christ. Christ came to my heart and my heart filled with joy. And I knew that I became a new creature in Jesus Christ. This is what it happens. The illustration which the Lord made here, he said that the wind bloweth, that's a sure factor, but from whence it comes and where to it goes that nobody knows. This is the same way that one which is born again also. We cannot explain all the process by our human language, but we can personally experience it that all those who personally accept the Lord Jesus Christ can experience the new birth in his life. Here Jesus said that except a man be born again, he cannot uh, enter the, into the kingdom of God. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23, Apostle Peter also substantiated to this by saying that uh, the Holy Spirit takes the word of God and uh, recreate the individual. That means it was telling that he are born not of the corruptible word, but uh, the word which is incorruptible and which stands forever. So you and I had this earthly birth by a corruptible seed, but the Bible says that uh, born again, that means the rebirth is a new experience that we avail in our life by the precious and everlasting word of God. God 
uh, um, gives us this new birth by his word and by his Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the person who uh, helps regenerate Christ into our heart. It is the work of the Father God that Father God begotten beget, begets us in the Spirit by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a very mysterious experience which cannot be explained in the human language, but uh, everybody who believes in Christ can well understand that phenomenon. So, first of all, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, that a sinner is born again when he trusts the Lord Jesus Christ. Here comes the second point. The Bible says that we are anointed by the Holy Spirit. In Christendom, especially, among the so-called Pentecostals and uh, Charismatics, there is a misunderstanding to the subject of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Many people, they have misunderstood that anointing of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. Nowhere in the Bible says so. Bible, we know that in the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended from heaven uh, and uh, uh, it filled in every people's heart who were waiting for the advent of the Holy Spirit that they all spoke in tongues. That's true. And this has been a controversial subject in the Facebook discussion in, in many months past and still people cannot understand. It. I don't know why, whether they deliberately reject it or they unwillingly, they don't accept it or uh, they don't understand it. I don't know. But the Bible, Bible very clearly says, that those people, those who had spoken in the uh, tongues were not speaking in something that is so special, un understandable to human mind, or uh, something that a man cannot perceive in his personal effort. But I think that they all were speaking in xenoglossy, that means uh, existing languages somewhere else in the world, but unknown to the speaker so quickly and immediately we have been empowered or enabled by the Holy Spirit of God to speak. That is the, the, the uh, tongue uh, spoken about in the Holy Bible. So what I want to emphasize here is that the word of God very clearly says that it is not, that means speaking in tongue is not the outward sign or one who is anointed by the Holy Spirit. Anointing is not at all a New Testament terminology. In my investigation and observation, I find the word anointing as an Old Testament concept, which the Almighty God uh, used with the priest, kings, and the prophets of the old. So the priest from time to time, and the prophets in turn, and also the king on their uh, throne, they were anointed and been placed on their respective places by this incident. For example, when we read the book of book of Exodus, where God was asking Moses to prepare the anointing oil in a very special way. What are the what are the what are the materials used in it? Is very clearly written down in the book of Exodus chapter thirty, where I would. Uh, 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 I, I would read that verse so that you will be able to understand what it is. That uh, first of all, we need to understand before reading it that what is unction or what is anointing. Anointing is an act of God by which that God identify and uh, sanctify or separate few people unto a particular service. Here in Exodus chapter 30, God asks Moses to separate or sanctify. Aaron, uh, as the high priest of the children of Israel, that he should serve on behalf of God, on behalf of people in the tabernacle, in the tabernacle as a high priest. And uh, his sons who were born of him, of his loins, were also being anointed by the same anointing oil, and they also were separated for that service. So here in chapter 30, Verse number 23 on, I will read it for you. You carefully listen to these verses which the Holy Spirit of God has recorded in Exodus chapter 30, verses 23 on. Here God says, Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, 
500 shekels and of sweet cinnamon halves so much even 250 shekels and of sweet uh, clamus 250 shekels and of cassia 500 shekels after the shekels of the sanctuary and of oil olive anin and thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment and ointment compound after the art of the uh, apothecary it shall be an holy anointing all and uh, uh, thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation wherewith and the ark of the testimony what's number 27 read again and the table and all his vessels and uh, this candlestick and his vessels and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels the and the labor and his food and thou shalt sanctify them that they may be most holy whatsoever toucheth them shall be holy and thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priest office this is particularly we need to pay attention verse number 30 and thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priest office and thou shalt not speak unto the children of Israel saying this shall be a holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generation thou shalt to speak and verse number 32 of paramount important it says that upon man's flesh it, it shall it not be part neither shall he make any other like it after the composition of it it is holy and it shall be holy unto you the anointing oil was specially prepared at the instruction of the almighty god to sanctify or to separate the tabernacle altogether including all its instruments that means table of shubhrad and the the altar of innocence and the candlestick even the lever everything was separated or sanctified for the particular purpose of god so anointing in its primary meaning has to do with the separating the instruments or a persons or animals for a particular purpose where in this act of anointing of the tabernacle and its uh, instruments and even high priest Aaron and his sons under the priestly ministry that God has made announced or declared that uh, he has separated these things unto a holy service and uh, separated Aaron and his uh, sons into the priestly ministry both in the tabernacle or in the temple so this sanctification was initiated by the anointing of the specially prepared anointing oil and strong instruction has been given that no one should make a, a, a kind, kind such of in Israel and also the, that this oil should not be poured on the, on the flesh of any people that means even priest Aaron the high priest and his sons were not being allowed to apply this oil on their body because that was strictly prohibited but it is, it, it is said that it should be poured out on their head and separate them under the service whereunto they have been called or separated by God. See here it has a New Testament application. In New Testament time only two places we read the concerning the anointing. That is, uh, first of all, we read in the second Corinthians chapter, second Corinthians chapter uh, one, I think, that where Apostle Paul is speaking about uh, the anointing in chapter one, verse twenty-one. Uh, listen, everybody, it's written here very clearly. Now, he which he which establishes establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. Two aspects are mentioned here the Holy Spirit of God. Now, now one is in the present tense that now he which establishes us, that process is still going on and it goes on until the day of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means everyone who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ are being established by the Holy Spirit of God on the word of God and in the faith and in the hope 
which every believer have in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a continuous process. It's used here grammatically, very correct by, correctly by the Holy Spirit of God. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ. And the second portion of that verse is, and that hath anointed us. It's, it's a perfect tense in the past. That means uh, the act of anointing is not been continuing. It is already been done. This is what I want to explain that when did, the, when did this take place and uh, who received this anointing and what is anointing is meant by. First of all, I tell you, uh, if you have the mind to listen to the word of God without mixing it to some other context and uh, you sincerely listen and pay your attention, you will easily understand that what, is, what does it mean. Anointing is an act of God. Act of God to do what? To separate certain vessels or persons or animals unto the particular service of the Almighty God. In this viewpoint, tabernacle and all its instruments were anointed by the anointing oil so that the, the tabernacle or in all together, including its instruments, were a holy thing to the Almighty God and it was a holy place where God used to dwell among his people. And uh, that, the, that is the idea that is accomplished by an anointing of the tabernacle and its instruments. And secondly, we read that Aaron uh, the, uh, was anointed as the high priest of Israel along and uh, with his children also, that means some souls was the priest in the priestly ministry in assisting him in the tabernacle. So all the priests were anointed by this anointing oil. Not only a priest, when a king has to be enthroned to his royal service, that he too, he was anointed by the anointing oil. For example, we know in the book of Shamuel that God assigned Shamuel to anoint the soul of the old as the king of Israel, as they repeatedly asked the Almighty God that they wanted a king just like the nations around them have, have theirs. So God gave them, gave them a king. That king was as king Saul. And God asked him to anoint him. That means separate him unto the uh, royal service in Israel. So he was anointed. And later when he was disobedient and have disgraced himself to the throne to continue over there, uh, we read that God again uh, asked Samuel to approach David, the son of a son of Jesse and anoint him and separate him for the royal service in Israel that is to be uh, done, you know, after the dethroning of King Saul from Israel. So this, that to happen. All the, in all the history of Israel, we read that all the kings who were born were being anointed by, by the anointing oil, and they have been brought to their offices as either priest or in kings to rule over the nations. And the other day, one person from United States of America, from among the Malayalis, was asking me another question. Okay, brother, that we read about the anointing of the kings and I mean, anointing of the priest in the Old Testament, but uh, nowhere he said that the name of the prophet was not mentioned in the Bible as being anointed. It was the wrong conception. I understand so when Elijah, you know, he built to die himself, just uh, lying down or sitting down under the juniper tree in the book of Kings, that God brought, took him from there and then he invested in certain tasks where in one of the instructions which God gave him, that he, he says there, that now you have to go and find out the age, Jehu and anoint, anoint him as the prophet, uh, uh, prophet of Israel. So here the word anointing is also meant for the prophets. Say so it's actually by anoint, the act of anointing these people, that means king or priest or prophets were brought to their office, respective offices you know, in public. That means public should recognize that these people have been separated or sanctified to the service as the Lord had directed them onto, the, onto their offices. 
So this is what for this to, in order to uh, acknowledge this truth that God appointed this anointing process to separate or sanctify these respective offices. In the New Testament, Bible says that every people who have personally believed the Lord Jesus Christ are priests and kings. Yesterday, one uh, uh, brother, I noticed that he wrote that in, the, in trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ that nobody is becoming priest. He was taking that is wrong. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, uh, 2 verse 9 very clearly that we are a priestly and a peculiar people. That means royal, ours is a royal priesthood and we are of a peculiar uh, generation or pe peculiar people in the service of God. So we are all born again and all the born again people are priest in the presence of God so that directly they can approach the throne of grace and uh, no mediatorship is necessitated. So that is what the good of the priesthood that uh, God has given us in Christ Jesus. Every born again Christian is a free priest in priestly ministry so that he can directly offer his thanks and worship and even uh, his praises to the Almighty God without the help of a mediator. In the Old Testament, it was not like that. In the Old Testament, we know that all the people were being carried, that means carried by Urim and Thummim, which placed two stone plates, which placed on the chest of uh, Aaron the high priest, and uh, bearing those 12 names on his chest that he used to enter in the Holy of the Holiest. That means he was a representative of the entire nation Israel. And he was a single man appointed unto that service. But in the New Testament, it is not like that. Everyone who personally believed in the Lord Jesus Christ is a priest so that he can freely offer the spiritual sacrifices unto the Almighty God without the help of a mediator as was in the Old Testament. And here what Apostle Paul says, now he which established you uh, establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. That God has already anointed us in Christ. We do not have a, a particular or special anointing each for each and every individual. Some people may be objecting what I am presenting now here, but your objection may be overruled by the ample evidences of the Word of God. What the Word of God says, Word of God says that we have no special function or anointing other than what, what we have received of the Lord Jesus Christ. In support of my view or support of my presentation, I would like to read two verses for you from 1 John chapter 2 verse 20 and 27. In fact, only three places in the end day noticement, the word anointing is mentioned. One is one uh, second Corinthians chapter one verse twenty, which I have read before, and second one is that that the the, the first John chapter two verse twenty it reads like this. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Here also, uh, Apostle John says that us that we have already an unction from the Almighty God. Uh, through Jesus Christ. And verse number 27 <clears throat> add to this, uh, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. That means, <clears throat> where Apostle uh, John says that we have received the anointing in the New Testament only Jesus Christ, not separately. That means, when a person believes in Jesus Christ, that he is anointed and uh, uh, appointed as a priest to do the priestly service through Jesus Christ, because he is our high priest. Bible says that he is our high priest. High priest. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. What a precious uh, word of God that we have. It is for our understanding, here the Spirit of God says that ye have received of him an anointing. Here also it's a past tense, the Spirit of God is used 
And in verse number 20, also the same. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. That means Holy One is Jesus Christ. And through Jesus Christ, we have obtained that unction or anointing. And therefore, no noticeable believer can have a separate anointing of the Holy Spirit, whether Pentecostals or Charismatics, object me or not. It is up to you. But my Bible says that we have already the anointing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I will explain it. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, we read that Jesus, prior to his public ministry, as a human being, that he was a perfect God and a perfect man. And in his earthly life, as a human being, that he wanted the power of the Spirit of God to perform the signs, wonders, and miracles of the kingdom of kingdom of God which he preached you know and to make the people to believe that he is truly has come down from God the Father so the Spirit of God as a human being that anointed him by his power we know that the Spirit anointed him and he was empowered and with that power he went into the wilderness to be tempted by devil and with the same power that he went to Galilee, Judea, and Samaria, proclaiming the kingdom of God. And with the same spirit and same power, or same anointing, that he witnessed for the kingdom of God, especially by performing miracles, wonders, miracles and wonders and signs. So this is true of Jesus Christ. Jesus as a perfect God, he was not, necess he was not in necessity that he should, he should have gained the anointing. But Jesus was a perfect human being working among the humans that he wanted that special power from the Holy Spirit of God. So he was anointed. And the Bible says Jesus Christ is the head of the Christian church. Jesus Christ is the head of the Christian church. And all those who are believed in the Lord Jesus Christ it composed of the body of Christ. So we have that body and head relationship uh, typified in the New Testament between believers and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What happened in fact when we received the Lord Jesus Christ? That I will explain in short. So when you and I personally believe the Lord Jesus Christ, what did really happen? That we were being added to the mystic body of Jesus Christ, which is the universal church. The universal church is uh, comprising all people of all this age who have, that is irrespective of caste, color, or religion, or their nationalities, that who have personally believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and accepted him as their own personal savior and law. This includes all people in Roman Catholicism or Jacobite Orthodox or Jacobite or a, a zero malabar or pentecostals or a charismatic group or brother or baptist or whichever it may be because god has not uh, separated these denominations as we are the causes for it but i am talking in a general sense what the bible teaches us bible says that the universal church comprises all born again christian believers so in christendom the born again believers are uh, staying in a, in, a, in a dispersed manner. That means in every Christian religion or Christian uh, denominations, people born again are there. That means even in Roman Catholicism, there are few people who are really born again. And uh, likewise, in any other Christian sectarians, the, it contains the born again people and non-born again, uh, non again people. All those people who are born again are added to the mystic body of Jesus Christ said, the which composed the universal church. And Christ is said to be the overall head of the, the, the universal uh, church, which is his body. So I would say that when we say uh, or speak about the body of Jesus Christ, that we are speaking about the universal church of Jesus Christ, of which Christ is the head. See, here the Bible says that the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God anointed uh, Jesus Christ only to the service that he being the head of the church that God anointed him by the Holy Spirit the head received the action and then body doesn't have it uh, separately body doesn't have it separately to illustrate this truth I would read Psalm number 
133 root 33, which is very familiar to us. Psalm number 133, a very short psalm uh, composed by uh, King David, where we read that, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is uh, for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirt of his garments. As the dew of heaven and as the dew that descended upon the mountain of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life for evermore. See, here are two types, that means typical expressions, and then two uh, 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 exaggeration. exaggerations are also given here. That is both in the two, 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 two category. That means first, the typological expression or illustration which uh, uh, David has given is that, you know, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Unity of the believers is the master content here in this psalm. And he described it as a as a or like the fresh like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. So here is also quoting from or indirectly allure, alluding to what we have already discussed in Exodus chapter 30, verse 32, where Moses, God commands Moses that thou shalt not apply this on the body of the people, but only on the head. That means Aaron was anointed by this special anointing oil upon his head. Likewise, his sons were also being anointed by the anointing oil on their head, not on their body. What happens when once this ointment is anointed on the head is the description here in verse number 2 of Psalm number 133. Here David says that it runs down from the head through the beard, even down to the skirt of his garment. That means what was being what was being anointed on his head, it it runs through his beard. That means Aaron's beard, and then it comes down to where the whole skirts of which he is worn. So what I'm saying is that the body doesn't have that peculiar or special unction. Only the head has it. Jesus Christ has the the legal head of the Christian church, which is his body, that God anointed him with the power of the Holy Spirit. So now that that power, which is resting upon the head, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, is running down to his body, which is his church, through his beard or through his skirt. And the whole body, in effect, become what? Fragrant. So this is what the Bible says. So body, whatever the blessings the head has, the body also share by the head is the principle which is governed by the Holy Spirit of God here in this psalm. That is why Apostle John, he knows Psalm number 133 and Exodus chapter 30 very well when, for what and when this anointing was instituted by God. And John says here that no one need to give you a special anointing. And then what you have received of him abideth in you. That means we have received the anointing or blessings of the anointing through Jesus Christ. And the body does not have a special anointing apart from the head which is the Lord Jesus Christ. But I have heard people in charismatic groups. Often they are preaching and they are shouting that tonight or this day, that several hundred thousand people must receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Even if you hundred years keep on crying before God that you need to get anointed by the Holy Spirit of God as a second experience, God is not going to give you that because every born again Christian believer has the anointing of the Holy Spirit uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ because he has believed or trusted him as his own personal Savior and Lord. In, a, uh, in actual, or I, I would say, or in essence, I would say that every uh, born-again Christian has the anointing as his personal experience, but only through Jesus Christ, no separate anointing. 
there is no separate anointing because we have the status of the body of Christ, not the head of Christ. Head, head is only one, and which is the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are the body. Body doesn't have a separate action or anointing is the principle which the Spirit of God has given here. In 1 John 2.27, again, uh, as I read it, but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. If you are a born-again believer, you have that anointing. Or on the contrary, I would say that if you say that you, you are a believer, but you have no anointing or you have not experienced anointing, you are agreeing that you are not a believer. So Bible says if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, definitely you have the anointing by the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as you are connected to him in a body-head relationship. That is a mystical union which is spoken about in the Holy Bible. Therefore, we are born again by the Spirit of God. And secondly, we are anointed by the Holy Spirit of God. Third idea, I have already explained the other day in the fourth session when I explained what happened to a sinner when he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ's relation to the Son of God. So therefore, I do not go into recapitulate them here to waste my time. That we became the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19, Apostle Paul says that, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you. God has made our body the temple of the Holy Ghost. That means this is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, which the believer's body. <coughs> so we have received that status of becoming the temple or the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit of God uh, the moment that you be believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And fourthly, that uh, we are given spiritual gifts by the same Holy Spirit of God. Every born again Christian believer is awarded or conferred with uh, spiritual gifts so that they may be exercised within a congregation for the edification and the building of the church. Ephesians chapter 4, Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13 and 14 elaborately discuss on this particular subject and I have handled it several times in the past. So therefore, here also I am not going to repeat them in connection with this subject. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 11, Paul says that, but all this works that one and the self same spirit dividing it to every man severally as he will. That means every born again Christian is given at least one spiritual gift. Some people have got more than one. And some may have got, got more than five or six. But no, not all people have received all the gifts of the Spirit of God. But because the gift was disbursed to the members in the body at the will of the Holy Spirit, not at our demands or at our request. Therefore, no one should pray for that spiritual gifts so that you expecting that it has answered your prayer. But the Bible says that he distributes them according to his own will. That he does, he knows that uh, whom should he should give it and who should use it properly for the glory of the Almighty God. So accordingly, the, uh, uh, on the basis of his foreknowledge that he disperses it and uh, people or believers in the church, they have different, uh, different uh, spiritual gifts by the Holy Spirit of God. It is the Holy Spirit of God who gives that spiritual gifts to all those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And fifthly, Romans chapter 8 verse 16, where Paul says, The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. See, one of the best evidences that a person has that he is born again, that his own spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, which dwells in his heart, is speaking to his own spirit that he is the child of God. See, I have that constant testimony, a continuous testimony of the Spirit of God telling me that I am a child of God. Whenever I am prompted or, you know, tempted to commit a sin or a, a wrong thing, that immediately the Spirit of God who dwells in, within my heart is giving me a, a sense or an understanding uh, that I am a child of God. See, Paul says here, we have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. This has not been a permanent experience of the Old Testament saints. In the Old Testament says, times, Bible says that the Holy Spirit used to come and go. But in the Old Testament, once he comes, 
that he begin to dwell in the heart of a believer and he never depart until the moment that he is translated from this world and finally bible says in ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 they in whom also after that he believed you were sealed with that holy spirit of promise that means every born again christian believer the moment he believed in jesus christ that he is sealed unto the day of redemption and uh, here in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30, Apostle Paul says to the saints in Ephesus that grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereunto ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. That means the day of redemption has to do with the redemption of our body, that we are on the process of a sanctification, that we are being sanctified, we are being sanctified now, and then we will be completely sanctified and being redeemed. Our spirit have been, spirits have been redeemed the moment we accepted Christ and our soul is being redeemed in our day-to-day -day Christian life and the body shall be redeemed at the coming of Jesus Christ, the resurrection, what we are going to enjoy at his advent. So here, Apostle Paul says that we are being sealed by the Holy Spirit. Seal has to uh, declare of two facts. One is, seal declares the authority or the authorship ownership and secondly it gives us the guarantee if you and i when we write some letters to some of some some of our friends or our relatives that we write the letter and we close it we take the let envelope and, and uh, drop it in the drop box of the nearest post office once we have dropped the envelope in the nearest post of uh, post office uh, uh, you know collecting box or collection box that no more it belongs to our property and the concerned postman collect them from the box and then put upon the uh, upon the envelope a stamp of the indian postal service and the indian postal service is uh, saying us two things one is that uh, we are we are belonging to the almighty god by the by the seal of the holy spirit that is the first thing and second thing that that means our ownership is changed to the Lord Jesus Christ. So far we have been under the slavery of Satan and sin. Now the Holy Spirit of God is profoundly proclaiming that we are belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are transferred to the ownership of the Almighty God. And secondly, it says that we guarantee you that we have undertaken the, your security uh, and we will, we will take you even to the last day and will present you faultless before the presence of his glory with the exceeding joy. So uh, the seal in its usual meaning, it actually gives us the assurance of our salvation or our guarantee or our safety. And secondly, our ownership that we belong to the Almighty God and uh, we are separated and secured by the power of the Holy Spirit of God under the day of redemption. So these are the uh, various blessing, the various blessing that uh, you and I have uh, in relation to the Holy Spirit of God when we have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. I will repeat in short and then close this session. Number one, relation to the Holy Spirit of God when a sinner believes in Jesus Christ that he is, Bible says that he is born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, 3 and 7. And secondly, Anointed by the Holy Spirit of God, that means he is being separated or sanctified for a particular purpose. And thirdly, the Spirit of God has made us his indwelling place or his temple, that we have become the temple of the Almighty God. And fourthly, yeah, the Spirit of God has given each and every believer in the church his spiritual gifts so that they may be exercised for the building of the, the church. And, uh, Fifth, uh, sixth, fifth, sixthly, uh, we, uh, it says that we are being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Every believer who have, every sinner who have believed Jesus Christ is being indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. And finally, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That seal, it gives us both the guarantee and the ownership that we are no more belong to ourselves or anybody else, but we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, our salvation is also eternally secured. And uh, according to Jude's uh, words 24, that uh, 
now uh, Joe says that now he who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with the exceeding joy and uh, him, to him be glory majesty for now and for evermore that means he is able to keep us through all the difficulties sorrows and problems of this earthly world and uh, we will be uh, safely brought before the glory of the almighty god in the near future so our redemption is also guaranteed thank you very much for joining with me this morning though few in number i know that many of the my listeners are in your workplace and we have not been free to attend this class but uh, here this message is on the uh, facebook channel you can just uh, scroll through it in the days coming and then uh, you can learn what i have presented here thank you for being with me this morning may god bless each of you and uh, give us a very pleasant day throughout this week and uh, i bless you all in the name of the lord jesus christ in his beautiful service uh, evangelist status they are blessed thank you Thank you.